Welcome to the Lesbian Review Podcast. I'm Sheen and I'm joined today by April and Tara, both amazing reviewers at the Lesbian Review. And today it's three reviewers, one book, and we're talking about Daughter of Mystery by Heather Rose Jones. So this is a really special episode. And now I'm going to hand over to Tara, who's going to say hello, and then to April, who's going to say hello in her gorgeous accent. <laughs> hello. Hello. <laughs> Okay, so Tara, Tara's going to read a synopsis for us because I'm feeling a little under the weather. So, Tara, go forth. Okay, this is from the back of the book. Margaret Sovetre did not expect to inherit Baron Savetse's fortunes, even less his bodyguard, a ruthlessly efficient swordswoman known only as Barbara. Wealth suddenly makes Margaret a highly eligible heiress and buys her the enmity of the new Baron. He had expected to inherit all and now eyes her fortune with open envy. Barbara proudly served as the old baron's duelist, but she had expected his death to make her a free woman. Bitterness turns to determination when she finds herself the only force that stands between Margaret and the new baron's greed. At first, Margaret protests the need for Barbara's services, but soon she cannot imagine sending Barbara away. And Barbara's duty has become something far more hazardous to her heart than the point of a sword. But greater dangers loom than one man's hatred. The prince of Alpenia is ill. Deadly intrigue surrounds the succession and the rituals of divine power known as the Mysteries of the Saints. That is cool. <laughs> That's a pretty good synopsis. So, well done whoever wrote that synopsis. I assume it's Heather. Yes, probably. <laughs> so she's a dynamic lady. I really love that book. I really love this thing. I was like, wow, she blew me away. <laughs> Well, I have been trying to get everybody to read this book for the last, like, two years since I read the book for the first time. Because when I read it, it sort of, you know, you get these books in your life which are pivotal books in your lesbian reading experience, which really open the sector for you. So you realize that actually there's a whole lot of stuff missing in lesbian fiction, which you, you get in the mainstream, but you don't get in lesbian fiction. And this is one of those kinds of books for me. So I've been trying to get some people to read it. I've put it on top 10 lists and stuff. And for whatever reason, there's been this kind of hesitance to listen to me on this. But as everybody knows, you should just listen to me because I'm brilliant at what I do. <laughs> yes, we know this. <laughs> this is why you're a queen of all things. <laughs> Finally, you two have read the book because I made it a book club read. I was like, I'm making it a book club read so that it's mandatory so that everybody has to read this book. And you guys actually really enjoyed it, right? Yes, we did. Loved it. <laughs> we really did. Do you think it falls squarely within the Les Fix sector traditional type books? For me, I don't think so. It deviates a little. Because it steps outside of the box, you know. I, to me, I think most Les Fix books, they have a lot of the romance and a lot of the sex in it. And they talk about the sex a lot in some of the books. In this book, sex wasn't the focal point in the book. Yeah, went on a journey. It was like a journey I had to go on with Margaret. Margaret, well, I know I'm pronouncing her name different because they have it as Margaret. But she went on a journey to find herself. So she came into herself and Barbara as well. They both grew up in the book. So it, it come like, I just watched the both of them grow together with each other. And they began to have a better understanding for themselves. And then not only the money part, the money factored into it, how the Baron gave the money to Margaret, Margaret. So she got the money, so she was able to do things with the money. Barbara now, Barbara, she didn't have any money, but she still had a little bit of growing up to do. So this is why I like this book by Heather Rose Jones. <laughs> it's definitely not your typical lesfic. We already know that there's this perception that all, all lesfic is romance. And this book is not a romance, even though it has a really strong romantic element to it and the romance that's in it is moving. That's not, it, it would be wrong to label it that way because it is a historical fantasy. Um, but it does also draw on some of the traditions that you'll see in Regency romances because it's, while it takes place in a fictional country, it's still very faithful to a lot of what you'll see out of um, romances that take place in the English Regency because Heather has really done a fabulous job of building in the conventions of what it was like for women at that time and for queer women at that time. So, I mean, for people that don't know Heather, she runs the Lesbian Historic Motif Project, 
um, which she does both as a podcast and on her website, where she's gathered so much history about women who've loved women throughout the ages. And she really, like, you can, you can see the full impact of having that kind of knowledge when you read this book because it just feels so real. Go Heather, go Heather. <laughs> so Heather calls this a fantasy of manners, which I actually think is just the most perfect way of describing this book. And in fact, all of her, her books actually fall nicely into this sort of sector because it does harken back to sort of regency type romances but but not quite because there's the element of of magic and mystery that's that is also involved yeah i agree with you you know um sheena because yes it's like a regency book but the only thing with regency books they don't talk about people being owned they tend to only focus on the gentry the upper class you know like with jane austen book pride and prejudice or any of those so when you think about it with Jane Austen, she would only show one world. But with what makes Heather Rose Jones' book awesome is that she focuses on the upper class, the middle class, and those who are owned. So you're getting a perspective right or wrong. You're getting the middle class with everybody. You're getting everybody in the pit here. So you're going to see the Baron. You're going to see Ma Madrid. She's there in the middle class. The full P household. They are not quite upper, but they are right in the middle. And then there's Barbara. And there's, then there's the lawyer who works for the Baron before he died. So you're getting a picture of everybody's life. And I like how Heather incorporated everybody. So she gave voice to each person. You know what I mean? Uh, absolutely. I think that's a, a fair comment. Now, you mentioned being owned. And this was one of the themes that I found particularly fascinating in the book. Was Barbara went from being the property of the Baron to being... Marguerite's property and I don't know for whatever reason this really just touched something deep inside me because it's such a unusual concept to deal with um, especially in something like lesbian fiction and it was handled with such a deft hand what did you guys think of it so before either of us answers this, I just wanted to do a quick check in. Are we talking spoilers in this episode or are we trying not to? We should talk spoilers because I assume people would have read the book. I think the thing that's interesting about this is that it shows ownership in a perspective we haven't actually seen very often. I mean, we know that people owning other people is something that has happened and continues to happen. Um, and is awful but she did something really interesting with this because actually the Baron did it in a way actually to protect Barbara and that's where it felt very different he knew that there were like bad people that had acquired all of this debt that her parents had carried um, and we don't actually know how big the debt is but it had to have been pretty massive because her parents landed in prison because of it. And he was also, in a way, protecting her from, you know, because she ended up in the very end, you know, this being kind of the ultimate of spoilers, um, she ended up actually being his daughter. So it was, it was tricky because it's that, like, does he out her as illegitimate if he claims her? Or does he put her at the mercy of some pretty terrible people if he keeps the secret that she's illegitimate so it's kind of a it's kind of a fine line so i think the best thing he did was he actually found someone amazing who would care just as much for her as he does i mean i i think I think he cared for her. Um, definitely Margaret grows to. And like he sees that, that special something in Margaret to know that like these two young women, because they're not even of age yet. And that was the thing that was hard for me to keep remembering was that like these are not adults that are going through all of this. But he saw something in them that they should actually be together. And that was absolutely right because they both became better people for it. I agree with you, Tara. 
I agree with you 100%. Because, as you said earlier, people have been owned throughout the centuries. And it's been a, a worldwide phenomenon. It's been a horrible thing. But when you look at how, indeed, Heather Rose Jones handled it, she handled it delicately. Because, as you said, she d she wrote it in a way to show that the Baron was using being owned as a way to protect her. Because when, when you think about it, and they show the part where Barbara read the law books, saying a child of two purses, it would have been difficult because her father had a claim on her, and then the Baron would have had a claim on her if he had owned up to the fact that she was his daughter. It would have made things very difficult for her. But being owned now, she doesn't have any property or anything of her own, so no one could have come after her to claim it. No one could have harmed her, and the Baron gave her a purpose in life he gave her like a trade for her to become an armin so she could always protect herself she wouldn't have to rely on anyone so i saw that fact as him actually caring about her a great deal because he could have just let her grow up like any other young woman and have her at the mercy of some guy who has to protect her but he made sure that she was armed and able to defend herself and not only defend the people that she's going to be loyal to or serving but this was a form of protection for her because it became ingrained in her after a while being an Amin. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was really interesting because she was owned, but it wasn't the same as we would see in any kind of narrative related to slavery. Like, it was actually, it's exactly what you said. Like, he made sure that she was trained so that, like, he, he kind of gave her the option to become a bodyguard so that he actually empowered her in a lot of ways. He let her go to the university so that she could study and he gave her a lot of freedom and in fact she actually had a lot more freedom than most women would have had at that time in the early early 19th century because she had a lot of freedom of movement with her position. She could kind of go where she wanted and and do what she wanted and socialize where she wanted you know within reason but she still was able to do a lot more and it was okay and and this is what i found empowering too because i mean being an arm and she got a certain amount of respect with it you know so she just wasn't just a will you know a little wallflower there it's like oh i'm weak you know he empowered her in a way to take charge of herself so she got all of this and she was treated fairly you know he provided for her he gave her everything. The only thing he just didn't give her was her freedom at the time. And and it is true, he really did try his best to protect her. And with him being alive, the debt collectors weren't going to come after her, right? Because the Baron is a man who had vast holdings, vast properties. So this worked out, I think, in both of their favor. And Barbara had a broader perspective from being an Armin because she got to experience a whole lot of stuff. She got to see, be around certain people that she would have never been able to be around if she had been just as a normal lady now being introduced to society. I want to point out that she was overtly owned, but but for most women, uh, being married was being owned in, in their own kind of way. All of their assets became their husbands. All of their decisions became their husbands. So she was owned on paper if you like but not um forced into a situation where she couldn't make her own decisions does that make sense yep i agree well it does make sense and i mean margaret was effectively owned as well by her guardians she couldn't do anything without their okay yes exactly and they were trying to f force her into marriage yeah, exactly. Like, and she was, even when she had all of that money, when she got the inheritance, she still had to stay in their house where it was cramped and not only stay there, like bring her arm in with her. And it was only when her cousin tried to sexually assault her that she had enough that she could put her foot down and her uncle couldn't block her. Very, very true. And I just had to look at the uncles, you know, because I got so angry at that part when the cousin Nicolet, he tried to interfere with her. And I was, you know, I was really angry because I'm like, how could the uncle put him up to this? Because had Nicolet been successful in compromising her virtue, she'd have had no choice but to marry him. So the wealth now would, would have transferred in a way, covertly, back to the uncle in a way because Nicolet is his son. 
So Nicole, you would have... That's not how I read that. The way I read it was that the uncle encouraged him to court her, not to try to compromise her virtue. No, I know that part, uh, but the uncle tried to tell him to court her, but uh, how I watch it now, right? He uncle wanted him to court her, but Nicolay now would have tried to fast track the thing, and I know the uncle would not have wanted him to do what he did, but in a sense, the uncle was trying to manipulate her in a way still. That's how I was looking at it. You yeah, know okay, I mean? now I understand what you're saying. Sorry, I thought... Uh... Yeah, he tried to manipulate yeah. her. I'm not saying the act that Nicolet did, right? What I'm saying is he tried to manipulate her into loving the cousin and into the cousin, you know, trying to get in on her good side there. So they try to keep the wealth now within the family because if she marries the husband, as Sheena said, the wealth would have gone out. The wealth would have gone to the husband and his household. The wealth would not have stayed with the full P household. Mm -hmm. So he would have lost that. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's what I want, meant to yeah, say. Yeah, I do get it. This segues nicely into the theme of money and power, which is pervasive in this book. Because you can have money, but not necessarily power. But money does buy a certain amount of power. But you can have power and not necessarily have money. And there's kind of interplays between the two. So Marguerite inherits the huge amount of money and assets from the Baron. But she doesn't inherit the title. I forget his name now, but the nephew inherits the title of Baron. Oh, Estefan. Yeah, that's right. But now, in terms of, of power, I also want to, and, and sort of sexual molestation type uh, scenarios, I also actually want to bring up that one of the reasons that Barbara actually chose to become an almond in the first place was because... Um, uh, Estefan. Yes. Is he a cousin? I think he's a cousin, right? He... Yeah, we don't know that at the time because we just think she's some like random baby that he that he bought. Um but yeah, he would have been her cousin. But he tries to uh, there's a brief mention of him trying to to get it on with her when he's a teenager and she's a tween. And when the Baron found out about this, he gave her the option, like, what do you want to do? Do you want to learn self-defense? Do you want to learn to protect yourself? Because then this is how we're going to do it. And she chose that route. So he did give her power in S, you know, in a way, um, through uh, letting her make this decision. And then the money thing, I mean, it's so interesting because Barbara was so angry when she discovered that he was her father. And you can kind of understand why, because he didn't want to like lose his money his assets to this man who he actually didn't have any, he didn't owe anything to. Money and power are just a really big theme in this whole book. So that's all I have to say on that. They are. Do, now, do you, do you actually think it's just that he didn't want to pay off his, you know, dead lover's husband's debts? Um, because I do think that's possible, but I actually wonder if he didn't do it more because claiming Barbara would have put her in a, in a position where she would have had no status at all in their society, um, because she was illegitimate. Yeah, I agree with that because an illegitimate child cannot really inherit the title or the lands or the money, but in the case of Stefan being, he being hanged he got his the king got his justice and all of that with him being hanged and the heir no longer being there she now has to step up to the plate and claim the title otherwise she could not have claimed it and she would have been ostracized and that would have put her mother in a position because remember she was already married to barbara's father and for now two men now to have claim on one child it would have caused a whole lot of stuff because barbara's mother would have really been ostracized and barbara Barbara would not have fit in at all in any society. She would have been given no respect. But as an Armin, she got more respect because she wasn't claimed. So she thought her father and her mother died years ago in this debtor's jail. So at least that kind of gave her a little cover. But had the Barbara, but had the Baron come out years ago and said, well, hey, this is my daughter. Nope, would not have worked out well at all. See, now that we're talking about it, though, I'm also wondering, but then... But then it's okay because she, she's able to take the title because she's the illegitimate heir or whatever. So... 
Yeah, but even that was was quite a thing. And April's right, she wouldn't have gotten the title automatically because she was illegitimate. So it would have still gone to Estefan. And then the only reason she ended up with it was because of that weird like thing where he, after he died there was a void and the she did something I, I can't remember, but there was some like political move as to why she actually ended up with it. Well, it was she handed over the letter that the Baron wrote that she hadn't even opened. Like that was just such a boss move. But how she got that letter, <laughs> like she got it from the lawyer um, and she was pretty sure she had worked it out. She's like, okay, probably this is just going to say that I am not just, but like, okay, this is probably going to say that I'm his illegitimate daughter and just like hands it over in front of everybody. That was one pivotal moment. I was like, wow, what is going to happen here when she handed this letter without even reading it? And I was like at the edge of my seat wondering, okay, what does it say? <laughs> <laughs> that was a boss move that was excellent Tara that was a fun it was a boss move she was such a boss I mean she was a boss in the whole whole book are we um am I able to just like profess my love for Barbara for a little bit because I have a lot of it I, I love Barbara too <laughs> but I think Marguerite is so overlooked the poor chick and she's so awesome she she inherited an almond and did nothing but try to protect her I agree. And I love that she kind of has that brainy Hermione Granger thing going for her. Like, I, I love Margaret too. I just, I don't know. I love both of them. I can love them both. Yeah, it's, it's hard to choose between the two. <laughs> Pro- profess your love, Tara. Go forth. Okay, so the thing that I love about Barbara, which I suppose actually ties back into the two things that we've just talked about. Um, I love that she just wants to do the right thing and she is so loyal and she hates that the baron didn't release her the way he was supposed to the way she had been promised that he would but at the same time she never once takes it out on margaret she does her duty she protects margaret as best as she can and eventually really grows to care for her so it's not just a job and she has so much integrity throughout the whole book that that just like that just made me love her so much even as she's like getting all this heartbreaking information and finally finding out like who her parents are and even still she kind of like keeps moving and by the end of it like is such a badass with that like how she ended up with the title um and then even right at the very end the way she shows up to get margaret just oh that scene that scene just like grabbed me by the throat and had all my feelings out in the open. Um, but then Margaret, like I said, I, I also love her because she has such an interesting arc where she starts out as this young woman with n- not a terrible position because she's not from, it's not like she's from the lowest class or anything, but not a particularly great position. And all she has is this dream that she just wants to go to university she wants to go she wants to study she wants to you know have her own life that way she doesn't want to get married and she gets all this money and so it's like finally I can kind of do what I want oh no but I have to get my guardians buy-in for that Um, and so she kind of like slowly starts to get towards her dream and then when she really starts to kind of harness the magic I feel like that's when, like, through the through the mysteries, the, the religious magic thing, I think that's when we really see her strength starting to come through. So that by the end, like, she's quite a badass. Like, she's able to do really amazing things with that. And I, I guess I just like that we watch them grow up together in ways that are really good for them individually, but also make them really beautifully suited for each other. Yes, indeed, Tara. Yes, indeed. I think that's well said. I think a, a beautiful moment in the story arc for both of them was when they went off to the nunnery because then they're out of the hands of all the grown-ups in their life and they, there's no more of this responsibility that's thrust upon them. They could kind of just discover who they were as a couple as well. And I think that was pivotal and beautiful. And then they discovered that their mothers were like best friends and that was so gorgeous. Heather Rose Jones is actually just a genius. The the sheer volume of story arcs, plot lines, interesting 
pieces of information that is woven through this book is incredible. Yeah, she does it so intricately and none of them are really left at loose ends. It's not like there's nothing spare in there. Everything that's in there should be in there and there's a payoff for everything. I agree. I agree because when I read this book and why I loved it so much and I went to bed late that time in the morning and I had to message Sheena and say, Sheena, I am late for work because of you. You (laughs) gave me read this beautiful book. What I really loved is the fact that Heather took two opposite people, people with different temperaments, personalities, everything, and put them together and showed that both were strong by themselves and they became even better people together. They brought out certain things in each other. And I love that. I love the fact that Margaret, even though she didn't know about lesbian relationships and women loving women, I love the way how she embraced it. And I love the way how she declared her love for Barbara. She wasn't ashamed, you know? And I just love the way where she wanted to tell everybody. She told the nun in the nunnery when they were leaving, hey, you know, this is what we are. Even though the nun didn't approve, she wasn't ashamed. And then she stood up to her aunt. And whereas before she would have kind of bowed more to their wishes, but I watched her come into her own and actually stand up for who she is. And even though there were times where she fell short, where she was ready to give up on what she had with Barbara, I just loved the way Barbara went after her. You know, she wasn't afraid to go after what she wanted either. But she was wondering, okay, should I flout tradition and just share my love for her? What should I do? And everything just came together really, really nicely. I just love how Heather created a world of her own, even though it's a built-in world with different class levels and everything goes, and the mysteries, everything. And her being able to see the visions in the church, you know, that was awesome. I really thought that was awesome. Well, that's a nice segue into our final theme, which is magic and religion and how Jones married the two and I thought that was kind of interesting because that's a really unique kind of take on a fantasy element. What do you guys think? Well, I thought it was awesome because there's not many authors who would use magic and religion and blend it together. Many people would just mention it by the way, but they wouldn't delve into it how Heather has delved into it. She kind of it's almost like if it was mystical Christianity, it's like if, if it was the beginning of how Christianity came, you know? They didn't really talk about it in that sense, like with anything with Christianity, but there's people having prayers, there are people having the little altars, lighting the candles and offering up their prayers and their petitions. So when I saw all of this going on in the book, and then it's just like, Margaret is seeing the visions and seeing the swirls going up in the air when the people are praying and asking for their one. I, I really got caught up in it because I never thought that an author would bring this to life, you know, so much for me like this, blending the two. Many authors actually keep it separate. Either it's a magical world or, you know, mention spirituality, by the way, but she, she really blended it and made it awesome, especially in the part where Margaret had to try to dispel, to turn around the spell that they were creating to try to harm the king's daughter and her sons who were coming, you know. She was there caught up in something where she thought it was a dream and she was trying her best to hold back whatever force was coming towards them. And that I really, wow, that blew me away. It really blew me away. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. The thing that I thought was really interesting was that because it's very the the religion itself is very catholic um like you can kind of see how it's quite rooted in catholicism but the way she does it with the magic is that it basically posits what if our prayers really work so that because the spells are effectively all just um scripted prayers speaking to the various saints so it's kind of that like what if prayers really worked if you did them in a specific way so that you speak to the saints and the saints respond some people are better at them than others and some people can actually see them so that they can tell how effective they are and i thought that worked in a really interesting way towards making it believable because for people who have been a part of um either the catholic church or similar um 
similar faiths that broke away from it but were originally rooted there like um, Anglicans or Episcopalians or Lutherans um, it gave something that we could all recognize absolutely and it, it's this is what I find so very fascinating about what she's done in the whole book is she went in and created an imaginary country but she situated it in a time that's very real with very real rules and then kind of bent them and made added her own stuff so like I think the depths of knowledge that it takes to understand history and how it all worked and then to mess with it so that you make it your own is just brilliant. Well, and that she even created like Alpenia has its own um, like words and things like that. So that like the titles for people like Maester and whatever um so she's created kind of the there's the hierarchy of everybody and there are all of their titles and there are all of their and it's recognizable because it's close enough to certain European um, words and, and stuff like that but it's different enough that it feels very uniquely Alpenian and that was why when I was like poking around on her website I thought it was really cool to see oh she actually has a PhD in linguistics so it's not only the historical research that she's drawing on but also like that firm understanding of how language works that she could draw on to use that to contribute to her world building. Yes, very, very true. I like that. I like the fact that she created these titles. She made up her own words, you know, and it was just awesome. Everything just fit in so great. And it just gets you caught up in this whole new world. It's like, yeah, she put this made-up country of Alpenia here, right on the map, but then there were other realistic countries as well into the book, and I thought that blended in really nicely with the same kind of social constructs of our society, with the same type of way that women were always accompanied in that same Regency period. And I think it was a really, really awesome book. I must give it to her. This is the first book I read from her, but I know it's not going to be my last because I really love what I read. And she really caught my attention. And this is the first fantasy book that I have read like this that just blew me away. Because with some fantasy books, I know what to expect. But with Heather Jones, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know where she's going to take this story. And I couldn't plot out what was going to happen. She surprised me. And that's what I like. I like to be surprised. Now, the second book in the series uh, continues building on this world of magic. Um, through Antoinette and Jean's story and it's fascinating and you guys absolutely need to read it and then the third book adds an element of music to to the magic and it's uh, I love the way how she's expanding our knowledge of how the the magical elements work and how it changes from person to person that's awesome really really awesome my lord thanks for recommending this book to me sheena because i mean if you didn't recommend this to me this gem would have passed me by it really would have unfortunately a lot of i know a lot of people for whatever reason they put off by it they think it's dense or difficult and it's actually not while it's a complex story it's actually really like uh, not a very difficult read no, it's not a difficult read at all because I am from the Caribbean and I can read this book and relate to some of the stuff in the book because I could relate to Margaret in a way where when you're under your parents' care, because when I was under my parents' care, it, growing up in the Caribbean as a young adult, you could not just go outside unaccompanied or on your own without permission. And then there were rules. Your parents expected you, okay, at a certain age to bring a boy home. And when I didn't bring a boy home and I wanted to bring a butch woman home, that became a problem. <laughs> but all in all, when, I, when you think about it, it's very relatable. I could relate to it and I could relate to the language in the book. So Heather wrote a book where anyone could relate to anyone from any country could read it and say, hey, I can see myself in a character. I can see myself getting emotional like Barbara because Barbara holds it all in. I can see myself in the characters and once someone could see themselves in the characters and could relate to some of what the characters went through, then that book is going to keep them coming. It's going to make them want to buy the whole series, you know? 
it's just real good. I'm mad that I took so long to read it, but I'm really glad I did. I'm definitely going to pick up that second one soon. <laughs> just don't do like me and try to pull an all-nighter. <laughs> uh, you know what? I think I might have done that when I... No, I must have done that when I finished this because I remember I was texting Gina and it was like past midnight telling her all the feelings I was feeling well, as soon as I finished it. Wow. I made sure to message her in the morning. And I was like, Sheena, this is your fault. I am running late. I did not get my coffee and I am running late. My eyes are no. chubby. <laughs> yes. I had I had to do it I had to do it right away. My whole family was asleep. It's not like I had anybody else I could tell. I had to tell Sheena right away. It was all her fault. <laughs> Great, so we'll both blame Sheena, right? Well, I'll I'll happily take the blame for this one. Uh huh. Um, but I guess to the to what you were saying about people thinking it's going to be a difficult read, it's not. It's not a difficult read, but it's definitely one, especially when you're getting into it. You need to have the space where you can really focus on it. This isn't a book that you can just kind of skim, and it's not one that you can read sort of while like the TV is playing or anything like that. Um, so I would say if you're going to start it, just make sure you have like an hour or two blocked off that you can just sit and read and sink into it and really enjoy it. Definitely. Definitely. No distractions and don't try to read that while you're sneaking and read at work or anything. Mm -mm, it's not going to work. <laughs> I tried it, so I know it's not going to work. <laughs> okay. So, so answer this for me. If you like this kind of book then read Daughter of Mystery. If you like historical romances, even though this is not a romance, you will probably still really enjoy this book because the, his, the world building is so fantastic and so intricate. And even though it's not a romance, the romantic element is very, very strong. So I think... Um, and that's true. Like, I would recommend it to mainstream readers of historical romance as well. I think they would really like it. And if you like books that are complex, that have a lot, like, you, don't read this if you only like really simple storylines. But if you like things that are, like, really well-developed, really complex, really deep character arcs, then I think this is going to be the book for you. I agree with it. Indeed. Me too. I really agree with this. I agree with the part where Helen wrote this book like a journey without having to put focus only on the sex. I enjoyed the book. I enjoyed the journey. I enjoyed the vibrant characters. And not just only Margaret and Barbara alone, but all the other secondary characters. I just love how everything just, you know, it was interwoven. Everything just came together really, really well. She tied it up really, really great. So this is a literary masterpiece, and yes, I def I definitely love this book. So this is one of my favorites, one of my really favorite reads, and it'll be one of my favorite rereads. Who knows? So because uh, both Tara and April liked it so much, it's got three favorites reviewer badges on it, which puts it in the best of the best category on the Lesbian Review. So check out this book. If you haven't read it yet, read it. If you've read this one, read the next one in the series. It's also really good. Do either of you have anything else you want to add before we go? Nope, just read it. <laughs> yep, check out this book and check out all the others from Heather Rose Jones. You won't be disappointed. <laughs> you can also find Heather on Saturdays on the same podcast channel. And she does a really interesting podcast on real life lesbians in history, historical fiction, and she interviews all sorts of interesting people. So she answers like really cool questions too. Like when did coming out actually become a thing? So go listen to that as well. I'm Sheena. I've been joined today by April and Tara to talk about Daughter of Mystery by Heather Rose Jones. This has been the Lesbian Review Podcast. Three reviewers, one book. If you enjoyed this podcast, then come and talk to us on the Lesbian Talk Show chat group on Facebook. You can email us on podcast at thelesbiantalkshow.com or follow us on Twitter at Lesbian Talk Show. You can also join the, our community of patrons and you get exclusive content. Go to patreon.com slash the lesbian talk show. The link for this, for the book, for all sorts of things is in the show notes. So check them out and click there. Thank you both for joining me today. As always, it's been a delight to talk books with you too. 
Aww. Thank you. Thanks, Sheena. It's always a delight to talk to the queen of all things about all things good. <laughs> and talk to Tara too, because Tara's awesome and I'm always talking Tara's reviews. And I think she's probably fed up of me by now. <laughs> no way, man. I'm never fed up of you. Don't worry. I'm your cheerleader here. <laughs> <laughs> That's all for this week. Bye. 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 <laughs> All right, this is from the back of the book. Margaret Sovitra did not expect to inherit Baron Savetze's fortune. I'm going to start that over because I'm trying to remember how to pronounce things from Alpenia. I think it's Sovitre, isn't it? Okay. I think. Uh, okay, let's try that. But it is it, it is Savetze, right? For fuck's sake, I don't know. We say that when we need her. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Yeah, we we could have really used her. Okay, I'm gonna try that again. 